This is head on here on Shaw TV. I'm your producer and host Ian Holmes examining the issues that really matter here on mid Vancouver Island and today's episode examining issues revolving around the Nanaimo RCMP detachment. I have new superintendent Mark Fisher, the commanding officer of the Nanaimo RCMP detachment in studio for a one on one interview. We're going to examine issues of uh, policing priorities, also uh, recent violence in Nanaimo, uh, the impact that has had and uh, Fisher's thoughts on that. A big uh, package also on mental health challenges. Uh, in the community. How does that affect the Nanaimo RCMP officers and the community at large? Also staffing challenges for the Nanaimo RCMP detachment and also a little piece uh, uh, towards the end of the program on innovative uh, policing. Uh, that, that and more on this edition of Head On. Uh, Mark Fisher has a 20 plus year career with the uh, uh, RCMP. Also a stint uh, as a municipal police officer with the chief of the Oak Bay Police Department. He's the commanding officer, former commanding officer of the Creston, Bella Coola and also the West Shore RCMP detachments. Uh, Mark Fisher, thank you so much for making time to join me uh, here today. Thank you. Uh, let's start off with uh, policing priorities. He recently took over uh, the department uh, a couple months ago here in Nanaimo. Uh, wh what is uh, what do you see as, as the priorities uh, here for the Nanaimo RCMP detachment? So when I came in, I inherited a uh, what was a strategic plan that there had been significant work done in the community and with the department. Uh, about a year ago, my predecessor, Superintendent McPhail, worked close through several community groups, uh, as well as uh, City Council here in Nanaimo and Municipal Council in Lanceville, around developing a set of what was a four-year plan at that point. Uh, and when I came in, one of my first jobs was obviously to, to get a sense of the community and of the detachment and what our priorities were and what our pressures were in the policing realm, and to look at that plan and make sure that's something that I thought were still key objectives for us to, to achieve in the community and I feel they are. I feel it's, it's a well-developed plan, a lot of consultation into it, so I would like to see us stay the course on the plan. Uh, one minor thing that I added to the plan when I went in front of City Council here about a month ago is uh, in regards to social disorder and mental health. I, I see that as an, an emerging issue for us, so it was one thing that I added to the plan, but the rest of the priorities essentially stayed the same. Uh, because I think they continue to be issues that are priorities for us in the community and they're issues that I hear about from community groups when I speak to them. Uh, the first category was around crime prevention and, and reduction in the community. So in that category we deal significantly with social disorder in the community, mental health issues, uh, street disorder, disturbances, uh, some of the liquor work that we do with the bars and licensed establishments in the community as well uh, prolific offender management. And prolific offender management centers around first identifying the, the offenders that are creating the greatest volume of crime in the community and then speaking with other agencies and working together with them to address some of this criminal behavior and get ideally to get either the offenders to those key offenders in the community to change their behavior mm -hmm. or consequently to, to work together to investigate and convict and, and put them in jail if they're not willing to change their behavior and to continue to commit crime in the community. But really dedicating resources to focus on those people and pay even more attention to them, uh, increase surveillance on them, visitations, uh, really letting them know that they are a key focus of, of our work in the community. And, and from your experience, uh, Mark, Mark, what kind of impact uh, has that had keying in on these, these high-risk individuals that have had uh, brush-ins with the law in the past? I think it's important. I mean, it sends a strong message to them and I think to the community, A, that they have been identified as prolific offender in the community. Secondly, that it's not something we're gonna let off on or that it's a flavor of the day. Uh, we've seen the difference in tracking these, these offenders and engaging with them and letting them know that they've been identified as prolific offender. And then secondly, working closely with, with probation, with some of the other services that are available in the community to encourage them to get back on track. So if they indicate a desire that, hey, I wanna get out of my criminal behavior and break this cycle, and they start making changes in, in the people they're hanging around with and start making a few better choices, per se, mm -hmm. then we wanna support them to get into programs to try and change that behavior, and that may be a housing program, it may be some sort of an employment program, or it may be simply encouragement from the police and seeing another side of policing to say, hey, you are, but you, know, you have done well in the last three weeks, a month, mm -hmm. uh, we're not seeing you come through our door or into custody, and, and that's a good thing and also engaging with some of their families to, to help uh, develop that support. Some of them aren't interested in that, mm -hmm. no interest whatsoever in engaging in services or support, and in that case, it's a matter of, of staying on top of it, doing surveillance, uh, and really spending that extra time on those investigations to try and drive down some of that volume crime that these people are committing. Another area that, that we focus on is violence in relationships, so domestic violence mm -hmm. in communities. Uh, we have a dedicated domestic violence investigator in our office now. 
and she works very closely with Haven Society, uh, the Men's Resource Centre and the Domestic Violence Court in town to really ensure that those investigations are given the attention they deserve. Some of them are extremely high risk investigations and obviously are impacting not only the offenders and, and the people that they're their partners with, but children are involved very often in that and they're some of the most vulnerable in our community in these high risk relationships. And we've seen what can happen if we don't pay attention to those type of crimes in domestic violence. So a really key area for us and we've given our domestic violence uh, officer some additional training in that area. Um, as well, there's a new initiative in the province uh, for a few communities throughout the province, Nanaimo being one, to set up a integrated domestic violence unit where we actually have an officer that works with, in this case, Haven Society, very closely to, uh, to do domestic violence investigations and also to provide support to victims on a daily basis. So we're doing a lot of work in that area as well, drug enforcement, liquor control and those ones. Another key area is youth, obviously, and youth is a priority in any community I've worked in. Uh, and I think we do a great job here in, in engaging through the schools, uh, dealing with youth, providing opportunities for them to get to know police on another level. So we have a, a party program that talks about um, the some of the things that can happen in risky behavior once you're in high school. And we involve, sometimes the hospitals are involved in some of that. They do a, a visit to the emergency ward, to the morgue sometimes to see what can happen in drinking and driving. And as well, we spend time talking to them. We also, I think, are focusing a little more, would like to focus a little more on even the elementary school and preschool mm -hmm. because we see the impact that high-risk families and, and youth that are involved in high-risk families. If we don't engage with them early enough, we run into problems and they become a, uh, somebody that's a client of ours later in life. So we have an opportunity to engage earlier and maybe make a difference uh, with some of those individuals in our community. Uh, lastly, traffic. And I think our traffic unit, in fact, I went to an awards ceremony a couple weeks ago, provincial awards ceremony, where the, our entire traffic unit received awards for Alexis' team, which means that they have to, each of them, not, not only as a unit, but each of them have to get over, I believe it was uh, 12 impaired drivers in a year that are, that are charged either through an administrative driving prohibition or an impaired driver charge. So to see a traffic unit where each of them can achieve that level and be recognized provincially is, is fantastic. I haven't seen that anywhere else I've worked. You see individuals that do that, that high quality work, mm -hmm. but to see an entire unit do it is fantastic. We also want to work closely with the Port Authority and have our marine patrols that we do in the summer in the harbour on boating safety. Uh, Mark, in terms of um, engaging with the community since uh, the three months that you've, you've been here, have you, have you heard uh, a theme in terms of issues that, that people uh, would like to see the direction of the Nanaimo RCMP detachment go in, in terms of priorities or initiatives moving ahead? What have you heard uh, in your engagements uh, with the community since you arrived, uh, Mark? I think a lot of what I've heard is good. I mean, I, I get a lot of positive feedback when I'm out in the community about the members' visibility, uh, about the attention they do pay to investigations when they get it. It's, it's very seldom that I get a phone call for, for the volume of, of files that we deal with and the number of officers we have, uh, I find compared to other places I've been, it's very seldom I'll get a call where somebody's unhappy. Uh, street level drug enforcement is something that I hear about. Uh, there's the presence of drugs in certain areas of the community and the impact they're having on some families. Uh, traffic is one I hear about quite often. Uh, and the mental health, mm -hmm. as I've said earlier. I mean, mental health affects several segments of the community. So those are the ones, and again, a lot of what I've heard in the community is very closely aligned with those priorities I outlined earlier. Mm -hmm. Recently, uh, myself and uh, Shaw TV's uh, Raymond Albert uh, went uh, downtown to the waterfront area, to the downtown core of Nanaimo, to, to talk to people about uh, the recent uh, rash of violence uh, in Nanaimo, uh, of course, very high profile, uh, the Western Forest Products Mill shooting at, at the Assembly Wharf, uh, two men killed, uh, two uh, injured as well, and two very serious uh, life-threatening stabbing um, incidents as well in an eight-day period, a period about a month ago. Uh, we went to, to the waterfront to ask uh, two questions to people uh, of Nanaimo. Do you feel Nanaimo uh, is a safe community? And also, uh, your feelings on the thoughts that the Nanaimo RCMP detachment does on policing here in the Nanaimo region. Here is that footage now from recently, uh, a little uh, action here, myself and, and Shaw's uh, Raymond Albert in downtown Nanaimo. Do you feel safe in Nanaimo, Beth? I do, yep. I live in, uh, in the downtown area and I walk around at night and I feel really safe. I feel completely safe in this community. I, I sleep outside every single day. I've never had any problems. It seems beautiful. 
I've been here my whole life. I've never worried about really locking my doors at home or anything like that. Nanaimo is, is a clean town. The police have done a really, really good job. The RCMP have done a really good job. I think Nanaimo's a really safe community. Yeah, I'd say so, especially downtown on weekends. Nanaimo's been a pretty safe town, and even with things that have been going on recently. There's been some instances, like, over the years, where, you know, you could be like, oh, okay, uh, this this isn't safe. People are realizing that stuff like that can happen anywhere, including our little port city. I think after you get a couple of high-profile events uh, happening, which has happened recently in Nanaimo. So I think it's definitely in everyone's mind. Then all of a sudden you start to question in the back of your mind, you know, what, uh, whether things are deteriorating, but I don't think so. I don't think they're deteriorating. We're all being a bit more careful, for sure. As long as you're you know, smart about your surroundings. I've always felt that Nanaimo was a very safe place, yeah. No doubt, in terms of if I felt uh, like I needed the help of the RCMP, I feel like they're at the end of the phone line, they'd get here pretty quick. I see a lot of them like in and out of elementary schools and at our own high school, so I would say they're doing a good job. You know, I haven't seen them out, out a whole lot. Uh, honestly, I think Nanaimo actually probably has a faster response time than places like Parksville. Nobody likes the police until they actually need them. Man, I would like to see them as much as possible. I have a lot of respect for them. The RCMP, they've come and they talk to me and just make sure that I'm doing all right. They're, they're present. I think that's what makes the difference in this town anyways. I love it here. If I didn't, I would have moved. <laughs> and uh, there you have it, largely uh, positive reviews of the Nanaimo RCMP, uh, RCMP detachment. Uh, some minor concerns about some recent violence, but all in all, people seem to feel this is a fairly safe city. Uh, uh, Superintendent Fisher, your reaction to that footage? Well, I think it's positive. I'm actually very happy to hear those type of comments because I think we try to do a good job on visibility. Uh, the recent spate of violence was a concern for us. You know, I, don't, I don't deny that at all. It caused us great concern. Uh, if you look at the violent crime stats for Nanaimo in general, I think a couple things are important here. One is we have made significant improvements uh, since 2000. 2009, I think we're about 12th in Canada on the violent crime severity index. Since that time, uh, the latest stats were 2011, and we dropped to 45th out of the 245 larger police services in Canada, which is a significant improvement. And, and for me, what's really important is do people feel safe? You know, you, your crime stats can be wherever they are on that scale, and often, you know, you can find somebody with really low crime stats, but the public is still a real high sense of, of fear in the community. And my goal is, or what I think is most important, is that people feel safe in the community. And I found those comments uh, a very encouraging. I think an, another key piece of this, and I think possibly feeds into some of those comments, is the fact that in, in each of those high-profile incidents in that two-week period, uh, we had the offender in custody within an hour. And that, that in itself is, is remarkable. Some of that is due to good police work. Some of it is due to, a large part, citizens being engaged and not being afraid about picking up a phone and, and calling the police and telling us what they saw and being engaged as, as a good witness. And in, in one of those instances, a uh, member of the public had a huge impact on likely saving that girl's life mm -hmm. uh, because he jumped in and intervened while the act was actually in progress at, at potentially risk to himself and yelled at the offender, and the offender obviously got scared off and, and took off. We were able to track him with a dog and, and arrest him shortly thereafter. But if people in a community aren't willing to get engaged and look out for their neighbors and, and people that are, are in trouble, uh, then, I, then I'm much more concerned. Mm -hmm. In this case, I mean, very positive to see the, the level of community engagement and support after these incidents. I think that's another important piece. Uh, the Western Forest product shooting, there was tremendous public support for, for the families, uh, for the employees at Western Forest Products and also for the police. I was very, very impressed to see that. In terms of violence, serious crimes, from what you've gathered about what's going on here in Nanaimo, do you see a room for improvement? I guess, I suppose there always is, a Mark, but is there something that mm -hmm. sticks out like, yes, this is an area I think that we can, we can make Nanaimo safer by doing this? I think we have made it safer. I mean, if you look at the change from, from 2009 to the 2011 stats and our violent crime severity index, I just talked to city council about this about a month and a half ago. It continues to drop. And that, that is the main indicator for me on, on how we're doing on that front. Uh, still a concern though. I mean, nobody wants to see these type of incidents happening in the community. They're very difficult to predict in some of these cases. And in each of these last three cases that you mentioned, uh, I don't see any way with the 
that we could have predicted in that time frame that those incidents were going to happen, which makes it very difficult to prevent. I mean, ideally, it's about managing risk, and when you're aware uh, that there is a potential risk for violence in a community, either from a, a witness, a friend, or the offender themselves sometimes, uh, our goal is to get engaged as quickly as possible and, and try to intervene. Coming up after this quick break, more from Superintendent Mark Fisher on mental health challenges, a, a big comprehensive package on that. Also, with staffing challenges for the Nanaimo RCMP detachment moving ahead. More on head on with Superintendent Fisher after this quick break. We're back here on Head On here on Shaw TV. I'm Ian Holmes, your producer and host, uh, speaking with Mark Fisher. He is the superintendent of the Nanaimo RCMP detachment. So on this segment, mental health challenges. This is a big one for the Nanaimo RCMP and something that really affects the community at large and also staffing challenges that the local RCMP detachment is facing. Mental health challenges. This, um, this is a big issue uh, for your department, your members, and you made that quite clear at a recent appearance at Nanaimo City Council meeting, Mark. Uh, I'll let you take this away. Sure. What, what, what does this mean, uh, mental health challenges? How much of an issue is this for, for the department? Well, one of the questions I get asked sometime, and especially around budget time with, with municipal councils, is around crime rates are falling in Canada in general, and in Nanaimo they've, they've fallen as well. So the question comes out, well, why do you need more police officers if you're doing a good job of preventing crime and crime is falling? One thing that's not measured in those statistics is, is non-criminal offences that we're investigating. So what, I went back and had a look, well, what is drawing on our resources in, in this community in particular. And the one thing I found, which wasn't a great, I mean, I guess the, the percentage increase in it was a surprise, but that it was a high volume issue we deal with is mental health. And I found that over the past two years, the number of calls for service that we attend that have a mental health component to it has gone up by over 20% in, in the Nanaimo. And that's a huge draw on resources because Sometimes, yes, it may be an, a, an hour we spend at a call like that and maybe a half an hour doing paperwork back at the office. But if it turns into an incident where we do an apprehension under the Mental Health Act, which is somewhat similar to an arrest, it's not an arrest, but they're apprehended under the, the Mental Health Act because we feel or our officers feel that the person at that point in time is a danger to themselves or others. And in those cases, we need to apprehend the individual and take them to the hospital to see a doctor. Mm -hmm. And our officer under the law, the Mental Health Act, is required to stay with that patient until such time as they physically see the doctor. Uh, I think any of us know in the community how much pressure there is in emergency departments for volume and the people that are coming through there and the staff that they have. Our officers sometimes can sit there for hours with, with the mental health patient who's in crisis. So that presents risk not only to our officers, to the people at the hospital, and takes a police officer off the road for a significant amount of time. Uh, the other thing I find with, with mental health issues in, in any community, uh, these are issues that affect all segments of society. They're, they're not restricted to, to the homeless that we deal with, to, to people that are stricken by pro poverty. This affects families in all demographics, all areas of the community. And there's a real, at times, lack of, of services available uh, because of cutbacks in, in health and the services available for community. So it's very frustrating for, for not only our officers, but for families and friends that are trying to support people that are in crisis. And obviously we get involved when it hits that crisis level mm -hmm. and attempt to manage the risk as best we can in collaboration with, with other community agencies. So the one thing we've tried to do here, locally at least, is to work closely with with supports in the community and support services in the community to, to manage risk around people that we feel whose behavior on the mental health front is escalating so that we can intervene earlier before we get to an arrest stage. And the other piece is to stay engaged uh, when we can uh, with families. I'm just simply providing advice sometimes and sometimes that is even helpful in and of itself. Uh, to know that they can call and ask for that advice and we may go and it's not an arrest situation, it's simply coming into a family that's having a difficult time with a family member and talking to them about strategies to deal with that, signs to watch out for in case it is escalating. Now mental health challenges, these files that are obviously pretty expensive when you get the expertise of people in the, in the mental health uh, uh, industry to assist these people, some high level um, help. We all know that there's not a never ending amount of uh, provincial funds to, to help these people. So, so it was so what is the solution? Is it a combination of a little bit more money and, and just trying to bridge, bridge, uh, bridge the gap and, and, and come to a solution with RCMP and, 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 and the community coming together and also some help from the province? What do you see as, as a, a plausible solution moving ahead? Well, as you said, I mean, there's, there's limited funds in, in health budgets and we all know what a pressure that creates uh, 
for the province to decide where to put those health funds and how to spend them best. And I'm not an expert in that field, nor do I profess to be, so I'll leave that to them their best to make those decisions. However, I think what we try to do, in, and several community agencies in, assist us with this in this community, is to work collaboratively to when we get the call about somebody escalating that we take the time as officers to understand that that is a key issue we need to to send an officer and spend time there addressing that issue be it with a family member at a community office with an agency that this person's engaged with or on the street and, and how much of that is in the, the RCMP's training of uh, mental health uh, cases you mentioned you guys aren't, aren't experts um, no. RCMP uh, the men and women of law but but uh, is this uh, given that it's becoming an increasing I issue is there more of an onus on uh, first responders like RCMP to, to know more uh, about this particular issue there is that's a very good point to bring up uh, recently we have had all of the officers in BC, you know, police, RCMP and municipal, have to undergo a, a new training course on crisis intervention and de-escalation, specifically to deal with issues like this. And uh, came out as a result of the Jakansky report, is one of the recommendations. It's an excellent, it's a full day training course, but that is the, the key issue that they're dealing with in that, is how to intervene in these situations, signs to watch out for, and a lot on, on verbal skills and listening skills to try to de-escalate some of these situations. Okay, uh, running a little low on time, so we'll shift over now to st uh, staffing challenges. Mark, I know there's some things you want to say uh, about this. Um, a request from uh, the detachment for three uh, more regular members uh, denied as part of this uh, funding crunch here by uh, the City of Nanaimo, City Council, as they put together the 2014 financial plan. What uh, what issues does, does the department have in terms of, in, in your opinion, at least uh, properly uh, policing and, and, and keeping the community safe? I think it comes down to a couple of things. You know, my job is to police with the resources they give me and maintain community safety as best we can. So in that area, I have to explain the pressures to the city and then make decisions based on, on whatever they authorize for staffing. Uh, in that case, that may mean adjusting some priorities. And uh, you live with that. I mean, I understand that they have a very difficult decision to make around budget and there's several competing interests when it comes to budget. In our area, I think we could use more bodies in the area of drug enforcement. You know, ideally, that's one of the areas I'd like to see some bodies dedicated to. As well, we have right now one person that is dedicated to working with community agencies on mental health and, and social disorder issues. We could easily use a second person in that area given the volume of files and the success that I've seen her have in the hours that she works and, and the work that she puts into it and the impact that has on crime and community safety. We could easily use an additional body there. Uh, so we'll go back next year and we'll do a little more work on, on talking about what our pressure points are in regards to policing and uh, hopefully have a little better success next time. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a difficult egg to crack. It's a, Nanaimo RCMP, it's a $21 million expenditure for the city of Nanaimo, a budget of around $192 million, I believe is the number. It's, uh, it is a yeah. very, it's, it's expensive. Emergency services is, is expensive. So uh, we'll, we'll track that situation uh, here in the months and years ahead. Uh, we'll take uh, our last break and our last segment, a very interesting one, innovative policing. Uh, Superintendent Fisher sees an Nanaimo RCMP detachment is a cutting edge department that's leading others and head of the pack at many others uh, in BC as it comes to finding uh, innovative approaches uh, to community safety. We'll get more on that after this break as Head On Here continues on Shaw TV after this. Ian Holmes back here with Head On on Shaw TV as we wrap things up with Superintendent Mark Fisher of the Nanaimo RCMP Detachment. So our last segment getting into innovative and collaborative policing. And uh, Superintendent Fisher, uh, this is uh, an issue that, that you're quite proud of and you see a, a lot of positive things uh, here in Nanaimo. What can you tell our viewers about that? This is one of the things that drew me to Nanaimo when I applied for the job is, is the level of community involvement and support for policing and some of the great things that I think Nanaimo took the lead on personally in, in the region and the area. Uh, Bar Watch being one, our bike squad works very closely with the bar owners and the community do a great job of, of policing the bars downtown and increasing safety down there. Uh, nuisance properties as well as another area the city's very engaged with, our guys work closely with. And the other thing I like about the work we're doing is the flexibility piece. I, I find when we work on youth issues in this community, our school liaison and youth officers, as well as our patrol officers, are very nimble in responding to, to changes in, in issues in the community. They're engaged in Facebook and using that as an opening way for, for youth to engage with police. As well, uh, we're hoping to do some work with preschool youth mm. in the upcoming year. That's a real priority for me because I think we need to get in earlier. Often when we get in with at-risk youth at the junior high, high school age, it's, it's often too late in some of those cases. 
and I don't know that it's the best use of our limited time in the schools. Uh, we still need to be there, but I think we need to focus on that younger age group. We're also involved this year in a police camp with the Port Alberni RCMP, where we'll see a group of Nanaimo youth go for a week to a police camp in, and work with police officers from the area on all different facets of policing, almost like a mini training camp to expose them to policing as well. So I think that's a, a great initiative that, that we're going to be involved in as well. Mark, thanks a lot for your time. Really appreciate you coming in. Thanks for the opportunity. That's Superintendent Mark Fisher. He's the commanding officer of the Nanaimo RCMP detachment, getting into a wide range of policing issues uh, here in the Nanaimo region, uh, region policing priorities, uh, the, the recent rash of violence uh, that we had uh, here in Nanaimo. Uh, Mark's reaction on that, mental health challenges, that was a very interesting component, staffing challenges, and also uh, here at Innovative uh, Policing. Uh, thanks again to Mark, and thanks for tuning in. That's been another edition of Head On here on Shaw TV, delving into the issues that really matter here on Vancouver Island.